besides the phone I know of in a uh, museum setting. It's the, it's the Bellstone in the Bowers Museum at Santa Ana, California. And uh, it doesn't ring now because it's on a concrete plinth, but it was uh, in Bell Canyon where it rang merrily for God knows how many hundreds of years. Um, and then two nitwits go up there because there was a local legend that there was a treasure underneath and they dug around and the thing fell down. Uh, the treasure was its acoustics, of course. And it was transported down to the Bowers Museum. And if you look at it, you can see hollows in the surface where percussion took place. It weighs about seven tons. Been doing quite a bit of work over the last few years in the Americas, uh, and I've particularly been looking at Vision Quest sites. This is one, just one example. Uh, it's in the Chukwala Mountains, uh, just on the border between Mexico and Southern California. And Vision Quest sites are very, very subtle. Um, and uh, we identified this one, and in the middle of it, more or less, was this slab of rock with this glyph, which the archaeologists there think probably dates to about 1,500 years ago. Uh, it's a blob, as you see, an amorphous shape with a pseudopodia going out, uh, pointing to one end of the rock. And if you hit that end of the rock, we may find out, you get a sound like this. And uh, obviously that metallic sound that we associate with lithophones. Uh, there was a belief, and I think ethnology can be important where it exists, uh, that the, uh, the Indians here, and certainly in other parts of the, uh, the Americas, believed that spirits lived inside rocks. And uh, the music they produced um, would sound something like that. My guess is, we can only guess, uh, that is an image of the spirit in that rock, and it's just helping you point where to get to hear it. Uh, then a few years ago, uh, Nikki Boivan, uh, then from Cambridge, uh, was doing work with her team out on, uh, in the Bellary district of the southern Deccan, India, and they were looking at the rock art that we see here. And then they were told by a local fellow that um, uh, the rocks produced music. And sure enough, uh, we see Nikki's photo here uh, of uh, the rocks being struck with a hammer stone. And uh, sure enough, they produce sound. Now, that's interesting. We're looking at Neolithic rock art on ringing rocks. To me, what's even more interesting, they're not far away from those rocks. There is a, a temple. Uh, that uh, has columns in it that produce sounds. Um, and then I've been doing some work on this and we found at least 10 temples in southern India that have remarkable acoustic properties from rocks. This is just one of them. It's the Nela Yapa temple. And I'll just quickly go through that with a little background sound. Gentle taps on the cluster of columns hewn out of a single piece of rock can produce the keynotes of Indian classical music. You can hear the seven basic notes come like a wave, as it were, from the stone pieces. Hardly anybody knows the intricacies of how these were constructed to resonate at a certain frequency. The columns in the Nelayapa temple, the example here, uh, date about 700 AD. It tells me that somewhere in southern India, over about a two to three thousand year period, we came from basic rocks to very sophisticated use of stone for producing sound. There was a sonic technology and acoustic technology in southern India that relied on rocks. And we hope to explore that a lot more. Uh, it's even now being used in the uh, tourist advertisements for Tamil Nadu, the biggest musical instrument in the world. 
Another natural type of sound uh, of places or echoes, I'll just give you one example of something we've looked at, is the Mazinor Rock in Mazinor Lake in Ontario. And along the waterline, just above it, are about 200 paint panels of ancestral Algonquin uh, Indians. Uh, they are red ochre panels, very faded now, as you can see from uh, the image there. Um, uh, but the whole thing is in a provincial park called Bon Echo. It's called that because Mazinor Rock produces quite phenomenal echo phenomena. And uh, in the summer, they go along in a boat and clap their hands and shout and so on, so they can hear uh, the echoes. Uh, you really can only approach these things in, in boats, and we've um, done that, and we've tested the acoustic, uh, the echo capacities. Where the echoes are strongest and come back the quickest, where the sound reflection is the greatest, uh, the rock panels cluster. It's purely circumstantial, uh, but I think probably meaningful. Where a rock face meets water, a water, the plane of a water surface, is the best natural place for echoes outside of caves and caverns. And these are the very places where the Algonquin say the Manitous, the spirits inside the rock, uh, inhabit. But there are other ways apart from lithophones and echoes in which rocks can produce music. We came across one at uh, Petroglyph. Uh, park in Ontario. This is uh, Petroglyph Rock or the Teaching Rock. And it's got about 900 petroglyphs on it. Uh, you look at the other rocks around and they have either very few or no petroglyphs at all. So you do say, well, what is special about this rock? It's a huge sloping slab of, of, uh, of marble. And uh, there's been a few weedy sort of uh, explanations or theses associated with it. We found what we think is the answer. That fissure, that crack you see uh, running across there, it's about five meters deep. And periodically, groundwater runs along the bottom. And when it does that, the sound that's issues is perfectly like whispering human voices. Psst, psst, psst. Very close to words. So we figure that it's probably an oracle rock. The, the petroglyphs are about a thousand years old. So we think there's an acoustic reason for that rock. Then we can think of the blowing stone near the Uffington White Horse, not now in its original position, but not far removed. And if you blow into one of the natural holes, why well, it's called the blowing stone. <laughs> get a noise like that. And to our modern Western ears, it can sound like a megalithic fart. But think if you were a Neolithic prehistoric hunter. Think of the sound of uh, a stag or an elk, and then listen to that again. You can find the... We tested this a few weeks ago in Sweden. It is the sound of an elk. It's, it's a perfect dead ringer for it. OK, we haven't got long. This is a, an hour and a quarter uh, lecture reduced down to 15 minutes. Um, I just wanted to tell you about our landscape and perception project in the Royal College of Art that I'm involved with with my colleague John Wozencroft of the RCA. And what it is, it's a forensic-like audio-visual survey of selected prehistoric landscapes. In fact, we're looking at Priscelli and we'll be looking at Avebury, incorporating approaches drawn from archaeoacoustics. Why prehistoric? Well, we want to attempt to look and listen as if with Stone Age eyes and ears, so as to return to sensory basics, reconstructing primary acoustic and visual perceptions by investigating topographic 